That's a good question. I think uh, for me, I have to be active in all aspects of chess. At the same time, I try to play whenever I can. Uh, my first priority is orbiting, of course, but also I'm organizing some tournament here in England and also I am a chess teacher at the same time. So uh, I think this is uh, something amazing about chess, which allows us to work in different areas. Hey everyone, and welcome to the November edition of our FIDE podcast of the Year of Women in Chess. In this podcast, we introduce you to some amazing and inspiring women in the world of chess, including players, authors, coaches, journalists, chess streamers, and arbiters. The podcast is a collaboration of the Chess Sports Association, the FIDE Women's Commission, and the German podcast Schachgeflüster. Today's guest is a very versatile person that brings so many positive facets and aspects into the chess world. She's a strong player herself and carries the WFM title. Additionally, she's an international arbiter for FIDE and worked as an arbiter on some of the biggest and most important tournaments, such as the Women's World Chess Championship. She's also a female role model, fighting for women's rights in her country of origin, Iran. I'm absolutely pleasured and honored to welcome Shori Bayat as our guest today. Welcome, Shori. Thank you very much. It's an honor to me to be here. Thank you. Okay, so let's get started with our first question straight away. As our guests from the podcast come from all over the world, it has become a tradition over the past year to ask where they're from and to tell us a little bit about their country and what the chess culture is like there. Uh, well, I'm originally from Iran, uh, but right now I'm a refugee in United Kingdom. I have experience of both representing Iran and England national teams. Uh, I think both countries have uh, chess culture. Uh, in Iran, we believe that we invented chess as a part of the uh, uh, Persian Empire many, many ages ago. Uh, but I know that it's a bit debatable because also India claims that at the same time. But uh, we know that chess is very popular there. Also, I think in the UK, uh, chess is growing a lot. Uh, in England now, we have chess in many clubs, many uh, national tournaments, and it's growing and growing. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for the introduction. We'll touch up on Iran and England a little bit later, but let's start a little bit with, I guess, where it all started for you, because you started playing chess as a child and were quite talented straight away and won numerous national tournaments already in your youth, such the girls under 12 championship in Iran, but then also later on the Iran Women's Chess Festival, some Blitz and Rapid Championships. What would you say from all the tournaments you played? Is there a most memorable one to you, or would you what would you consider your biggest success? Uh, that's a difficult one to choose because I played in many different levels in Iran. Uh, but I'm kind of proud that I was champion in uh, inter in Iranian Women's Chess Festival and also a junior champ uh, champion in females level in Iran. And also I won medal in all age groups from under 12 to under 20 every year. So these are part of things that I'm proud of. And also I am quite happy that I represented both Iran and uh, England national chess teams. Yeah, lo loads of successes to, to choose from actually. Um, When you started, so we already just said that there was a lot of national tournaments you did really well in, but you also said that you played for both the Iranian and the, the English national team. So that means chess enabled you to play a lot of tournaments abroad. And I was wondering what role that played for you and for your chess development, but maybe also for your personal development. Uh, chess had a big impact in my life because I think it kind of shaped my uh personality at the same time. Chess provides loads of opportunity for traveling and we can learn from traveling. That's very important. It broadens our knowledge and horizons. And uh, when we travel to each country, we learn about a new culture. Uh, so this is very uh, important and valuable for me. Also, I learned from chess about uh, uh, planning, calculation, judgment, 
and critical thinking and of course many many benefits that I that chess has and it is impossible to mention all of them at the same time uh, but one of the things that uh, was very critical for me uh, was this uh, critical thinking because I came from a, a country Iran in which uh, of course uh, women were kind of restricted and as a result of that, uh, chess, gave, chess provided me more opportunity to be able to compare uh, different societies and different countries at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, um, I guess, like traveling in general educates and, and a lot of the, the skills we learn in chess can be transferred to, to wider life. Okay. Um, what I'd like to focus on next, because I know you're you're a great chess player, but I think what you're even more known for is that besides playing chess yourself, you're also one of the top arbiters actually in the chess world. And can you tell us a little bit on how you became interested in being an arbiter and your journey to get there? Yes, that's quite uh, interesting. Uh, because my journey for being arbiter started since I played uh, since I was a uh, kid and I was a player uh, because in my country Iran uh, women couldn't play against uh, men and other genders uh, so uh, basically my father managed to get some permission for me because I was the only top player in my city so I was allowed to play against uh, male players at the same time uh, but when I when I used to go to their tournament I was the only female player and I was quite uh, young at the uh, age of uh, let's say 10 something like that and then uh, I didn't have anybody to speak to because it was a male dominated area and uh, basically, I was just watching arbiters, how they do pairings with those cards. Those days, we didn't have Swiss manager. So it was like every week I was there and I was watching arbiters how to work. Eventually, I became interested on being uh, interested in being arbiter, uh, but they wouldn't allow me to participate in arbiters course because it was not uh, uh, allowed until you are at the age of 18 in Iran. And I was just asking to allow me to participate in the course, but they said that if you participate, we know that you can pass the exam and then we cannot give you a certificate for that. So that was how my journey started. But as soon as I became to the age of 18, I participated in those courses. I got my uh, arbiter's degree and we, have, we had three uh, different level of uh, national arbiters in Iran. I kind of mixed that uh, with experience of orbiting and uh, yeah, also I was playing at the same time. But when I participated later in a FIDE Orbiter seminar, uh, then I realized that I just want to continue as an orbiter. So I started uh, to slowly to be retired from playing and uh, replace it with orbiting. Okay, for our listeners that might be a bit confused why arbiters are needed in chess, as the rules are pretty clear, could you maybe explain what exactly the, the roles are that arbiters play in a tournament? So what is the scope of the projects they have? And maybe like give one or two examples of, of when like an arbiter was necessary in these tournaments for like claiming a dispute? Yes, sure. Uh, the arbiter's role is in chess is divided in three areas before the tournament, during the tournament and after the tournament. Uh, before the tournament, it's basically regarding pairing inspection of the playing hall to make sure that we provide a proper environment for players. During the tournament, we, in, uh, we make sure that laws of chess are being followed and also anti-cheating uh, matters and uh, we make sure that everybody are playing uh, in a mm, fair environment. And then after the tournament, we need to uh, publish the standing and uh, of course uh, to report tournaments for rating and uh, this sort of matters. Very interesting. And, and I, I assume especially at the moment where we have so many online cheating, chess things happening, that the, the role of the arbiter becomes very much visible. Because usually if all goes well, I guess, as arbiters, you're always in the background, right? 
Yes, that's true. Actually, the best orbiters, we say that the orbiters which are kind of invisible, but they are not inv invisible at the same time because uh, they don't want to go and show off. They don't want to uh, distract players by getting so close to their boards. But at the same time, they are supervising all and each players in the playing hall. Uh, especially these days that we have many uh, chess softwares, uh, the role of orbiters uh, regarding fair play matters is very important. They must uh, supervise players all the time and to make sure that uh, uh, the playing uh, area and the playing situation is uh, totally safe. Mm -hmm. And what is it that you particularly like about arbitrating? Like, for example, if you would have to to convince someone or like especially to like for example try to get more women into chess why would you say should people go into arbiting what is it that you really enjoy about it i think i have always loved the rules and regulations so i i think this is something that i'm good at it i can uh, uh, talk and debate for uh, even one sentence in the in the rules for hours and days and weeks so this is something very common about, uh, among arbiters uh, yeah i think this is my interest to rules and at the same time i love chess i enjoy watching games and learning from them so, and uh, also i love uh, our chess environment so it is a opportunity to be in different chess tournaments to travel and also to enjoy social aspects of chess mm -hmm. And I mean, like you're an incredibly talented arbiter without doubt. And you were an arbiter at pretty much most of the big events, I would say, at like Olympiads, the Women's World Championship, the London Chess Classic, Gibraltar. Is there a specific tournament that you haven't been to that you would really like to go? Or do you still have like, once you've been to all these big tournaments, what are your ambitions as an arbiter from here onwards? Um, I think I'm quite happy with the events that I'm working on it. Uh, my ambition is just to keep myself always up to date and to study and uh, to provide some educational documents for arbiters. As you know, since four years ago, I was working in the uh, uh, in the FIDE Arbiters uh, Commission as well. So uh, I'm in charge of FIDE Arbiters Manual. This is something that uh, made me so happy because I could uh, develop the book a lot. I, I know not only me, but many other arbiters also um, contributed to this uh, book. But I think uh, this is something that... Uh, for me is the next step to educate other orbit to help the other arbiters to develop the, to their development and uh, increasing the number of female arbiters yeah and the uh, FIDE arbiters commission so what exactly does this commission do so you, you update the rules and then you also organize some coaching sessions for new arbiters uh, actually, we don't update the rules, but we comment on that. We give guidelines to arbiters about how to um, how to understand each uh, article, what is the behind of each article, and uh, we give them different examples how to uh, behave in different situations, and uh, then we allow mm -hmm. them to compare those things together to to be able to act in. Uh, even situations that they are not familiar with. We also pro organize different uh, FIDE Arbiter seminars around the world. During the pandemic time, we started to go online as well. So we organized many uh, courses for people who wanted to be online arbiters and also to work in hybrid tournaments at the same time. We worked uh, in uh, educating our lecturers because we have many feeder lectures at the same time. Uh, so we organize some sessions for them to have some standardized uh, exams and also materials that they can use. Uh, also in FIDE Arbiters Commission, we provided a platform that is accessible for all arbiters. They can uh, get, uh, I mean, it's accessible for all lecturers and some also many arbiters that they can get access to sample questions uh, of exams at the same time. 
Okay, so so loads of different things actually that are happening in the commission there. Maybe I have one question to follow up because one of the things, I mean, arbiters, like I guess everything in chess is there's not so many females. What? How do you think the number of female arbiters can be in- increased? I think this is something that we need uh, to work from national levels as well uh, because uh, we need federations also to support the arbiters. FIDE is one part and then the national federations to support the arbiters and also especially continental uh, federations as well. Uh, because, for example, I can give you an example of Asia based on my personal experiences. I was the first category a female arbiter in Asia and then uh, I felt that Asia is a male dominated uh, continent for arbiters because there was not enough opportunity for female arbiters and I got the title because of working in world events but at the same time uh, we couldn't get opportunity to work in continental events at the same time now I this year I became the best European arbiters from FIDE uh, in female section. Uh, But I see that I'm receiving many, many invitations from European uh, chess uh, federation. And uh, there are loads of opportunities to work for uh, continental tournaments here. So in order to uh, work uh, and increase the number of female arbiters, I think we need to work in a way to increase and uh, help uh, orbiters in national levels and continental levels as mm-hmm. yeah and just offer possibilities for them to to gain experience and like motivate them to go in yeah i think these are really good points um one match i want to talk to you because it was uh, one of the big matches you served as an arbiter as but i i mean it was also personally a very very life-changing event for you is in 2020 where you served as the chief arbiter of the women's world championship match um and during the tournament a photograph appeared um which in iran was interpreted as you not wearing a hijab and create a big controversy do you want to tell us about the tournament and what exactly happened there yes that was a um, very important uh tournament for me. I was so happy that I got appointed to that tournament uh, because uh, that was the highest tournament uh, in my chess career that I worked uh, in. And then, uh, as you know, many things and uh, drama happened during the tournament, which I was not expecting. Uh, The tournament had two legs, uh, one leg in China and the second leg in Russia. Uh, When I was in uh, uh, when I was in China during the tournament, some of photographs of me was published from an angle that my headscarf was not very visible. And uh, then uh, Iranian media used those photographs to condemn me for not wearing headscarf. Actually, I was wearing it, but in a loose way. But uh, unfortunately, there was not, no time to explain it to media because they were already condemned me. They asked for public apology. There were loads of pressures from the Federation also. Uh, They told me to just wear black clothes and cover all your hair and write public apologies. Of course, uh, that was a clear decision that I couldn't do these things because I believe that uh, people should be themselves. They shouldn't uh, follow the things and uh, do actions that uh, they don't uh, actually believe on them so i decided to not wear head scarf anymore i went to the tournament after four rounds in which i had head scarf out of mandatory hijab not out of choice uh, and then i decided not to wear it to stand by, by iranian people because iranian people are mm, people who believe in freedom of choice uh, and uh, this is not our culture. I know that some people misunderstand our culture and they think that hijab is our culture, but it is not. Uh, back then, I think that was a right decision. And if things go back, I still take the same decision to stand for what I believe in. Uh, that was the 
one aspect of the tournament the other aspect was that uh, because this happened during this world chess championship tournament uh, I used the tournament as a coping mechanism at the same time because I told to myself uh, I'm here because of this tournament I have to do my role and responsibility properly and also my life is changing and it's affecting uh, all my life but I have to just concentrate on the tournament and I think uh, from chess perspective the tournament was a big success yeah it, it must have been you know you go to this tournament and you're just so proud to serve as an arbiter there and then things happen that you're just not prepared for and it's absolutely to me absolutely amazing how you still manage to 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 be such a good arbiter there and and just take such strong decisions thank you um and i think that's very admirable um yeah so so after the tournament you then couldn't return to iran and you decided to go to the uk is that correct yes that's correct and i remember that when i was at the airport i had a ticket printed ticket of my flight to Tehran so the office there at the UK airport in London found it and took it for the record of his documents so yeah I was very happy to come back to Iran but unfortunately it didn't happen and I had to find another destination to come I'm very pleased to be in the UK right now because this is a country which respects the human rights and women rights and I received many supports from uh, people here and especially my uh, chess family. So uh, I think I'm lucky to be a chess player, to have a chess family. Yeah, because you, you really, like in, in the UK, then you took so many positions straight away and you got involved as an arbiter. And um, I, I've seen you, as I said, now also played for the for the UK national, well, the English national team, because it's not UK that plays, right? Um so yeah, you really made chess, I guess it was a way to, to get in contact there with people and settle there as well. Yes, actually, we always say that we are one family, that's our motto. But I couldn't uh, really understand and feel it until I moved here. Uh, because when you understand these things when you are in tough and difficult situations. And uh, when I came here, immediately, people who I didn't know them, uh, they offered me to live with them, those chess people. I was very lucky to uh, stay with two chess arbiters, uh, Laura Barnes and Alex McFarlane. Uh, I lived with them for some time. And that was quite funny because we had uh, like uh, three top arbiters at the same time in one house. Oh, wow. <laughs> I can I can see what geeky conversations you had at the dinner table. <laughs> exactly. So every conversation was about chess. And then at some time, three of us were in the same Zoom meeting for FIDE, or we just come the same time. So that was quite funny. But also, I was then uh, moved to, after that, I moved to London and uh, then uh, another international master, John Cox, offered me to live with him and his family for some time. So they helped me as well. Uh, I work for CSC, Chess in the Schools community, running by Malcolm Payne. And uh, it's uh, something that I'm very happy about it. I think the best uh, job in the world is to work with children and teaching them chess. So I think that's the best thing that happened to me. And also, I'm very lucky to work for English Chess Federation. I'm director of event and board member there. And uh, yes, I also represented England. I played in some uh, tournament here as well. So after such a long gap uh, here, first I played in some online tournaments during the COVID time, and I actually won some tournaments at the same time as well then I played in Richmond the uh, tournament and I won the first female uh, prize there as well and now also I'm a, a coach in uh, the same place as well yeah so loads of facets it's going to be interesting to see where your journey continues because um, well I guess being an arbiter and being a player always happens at the same time so I'm curious what, what you'll do for the next few months or years or where you'll put your priority 
Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, for me, I have to be active in all aspects of chess. At the same time, I try to play whenever I can. Uh, my first priority is orbiting, of course, but also I'm organizing some tournament here in uh, England and also uh, I am a chess teacher at the same time, so uh, I think this is uh, something amazing about chess, which allows us to work in different areas. Yeah, and the, the chess teaching you do in schools with children or adults or everyone? In, it's actually uh, chess for uh, primary school children, so chess is a part of school curriculum in England. and. Uh, I work in different primary schools to teach chess to children. Also, for some time, I went to uh, to Cardiff as well. I was covering four different primary schools there as well. Uh, it's just amazing to teach chess to other people and uh, seeing how they can enjoy and benefit from chess, especially children, you know, that's very important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you really take all the aspects of chess. That's why I call a real chess life, I guess. Before we move on with some further chess question, um, I'd like to go back to your, well, the role you play in fighting for women's rights in Iran, because I, it's a very important topic again at the moment with all the massive protests happening in Iran. And um, I also saw that your story is picking up in in visibility now again and that you've been interviewed by some of the big newspapers and actually I'm German I also saw that you were a guest in one of the German podcasts um, so I, I just wanted to to see how you see your role now that you're in the UK what do you see your role as in the current situation in the fight for women's rights? Yes, that's something that uh, happened in my life and then it kind of turned to my responsibility right now to speak up because uh, it's important to fight for women's rights and for human rights. We cannot uh, stay quiet about these things. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult for me because it's also mm, very sad to see what is happening in Iran when you see innocent people are being killed for asking their basic rights for uh, just freedom of choice. And uh, this is uh, something that I think about it every day. Uh, I can't stay quiet about it. Uh, and I think this is my responsibility to support Iranian people to be their voice whenever I can. Uh, I, that's why I give interview to different media and uh, also these days with Iranian TVs as well, I mean, overseas TVs, uh, but also I'm planning to go to the uh, US in November uh, for two reasons. Uh, first part is part, uh, to orbiting some chess tournaments, and the second part is that I will go to Washington, D.C. to speak about the uh, Iranian situation uh, with people in U.S. Department of the State to make sure that uh, we support Iranian people. Oh, wow, that, that is indeed very big. And I think actually in the U.S., um, people took note of your of your actions before because you were awarded the International Woman of Courage Award in 2020. Mm, what is this award exactly? Because I think it's also a U.S. award. And what does it mean uh, to you? This is uh, something that I am proud of, uh, proud of it. But at the same time, I think that I don't deserve it. Uh, because when I see how many courageous ladies and people are in Iran, I feel that this award should belong to them. There, are, there could be many people other than me who could be uh, nominated for this award. And uh, I thought that I should accept it because uh, then it helps uh, to Iranian people uh, to raise their voice around the world so that they can, people can hear their message, uh, message of freedom, peace, women love freedom, which is very important for us. Uh, that's why I accepted this award, but I also mentioned that I'm just representing Iranian women and this award belongs to all of them. Yeah, these are very, very powerful words and um, 
I think it's it's you know being in a in a position like you are like in in the spotlight or being a a famous sports person comes with a lot of perks, but very often also with a lot of responsibility, and uh, it's not always easy to take. Um. Yeah. So so moving on from that, I I think yeah as I said it's it's super inspirational. Um, not just for for women in chess, of course, but for everyone to see. But of course, I'm very proud that someone from the chess world is taking taking such a courageous role. Should we follow up a little bit on the tournaments you mentioned that you'll be arbitering in the US? So what what is your agenda for the rest of the years? Which tournaments can we expect to see you? For now, um, uh, yeah, I'm planning to go to North Carolina for. Uh, arbiting some tournaments, um, master tournaments in Charlotte. So this is quite exciting for me because I know that Charlotte Chess Center is really doing great. And I see people running this organization are really inspiring. So I think this is an honor for me to cooperate with them and work with them. Uh, that's my plan for November but also as you know every day in my life is about chess so from each Monday to Friday I'm teaching chess to uh, children in primary schools I also planning to organize a national uh, norm tournament uh, for English players but open to foreign players as well it will be in Cambridge in February, so I have to work on this tournament to make it possible. Um, I'm a bit biased, but I would recommend people, if they are interested in the national to people, to go because Cambridge is absolutely beautiful. Will this be a open tournament or a women specific one? It will be an open tournament, but we also are organizing a, a round robin female tournament at the same time. In uh, as a side event tournament uh, this is something for ladies as well so they can decide to participate in round robin section or in open section perfect sounds great uh, one one question that, that came to my mind when you said that you're going to arbiter a tournament in the US or I guess any tournament is what does your do you have a specific preparation when you when you arbiter a tournament you know I guess like players have like their like a increased training schedule or something like this is there a particular thing you do to prepare for a tournament or do you have any kind of rituals before the games or before before you go to these tournaments uh, before each tournament when i want to work in a tournament i try to review laws of chess one more time I don't know how many times I have read it, but for each tournament, I force myself to read it one more time. And then also uh, I need to study regulation of that specific tournament because for each tournament we have a regulation. And uh, during the tournament, of course, uh, our job is different. But uh, as you asked about preparation, I think these are my preparations to make sure that I'm up to date with all laws and regulations. Okay, then this is the preparation during the tournament. What can I imagine your day to be like? Because I, you will probably have to be there before. You're probably the, the first to come and the last to leave. Yes, during the tournament, uh, my preparation partly is before the first round. So I need to go to the playing hall to make sure that everything is uh, ready. So I kind of patrol the playing hall, uh, chairs, tables, all equipment, spare play things, uh, everything, light, ventilation. And also we check registered players, their ratings, and then uh, we I use some pairing software, so I need to check for each tournament which pairing software we want to use. And uh, then during the tournament, of course, our job is uh, supervising, inputting results, and to make sure that these are correct, and also uh, to supervise fair play matters. Yeah, and again, because I guess arbitrating is, is very... A lot of us don't know that much about it. How how are arbiters for different tournaments are po appointed? Are you going, if you see an interesting tournament, do you message the organizers or do the organizers message you? Like, what is the procedure there? 
Uh, I think it depends on which level of orbiting you are working. Uh, when I was not a famous arbiter, I used to write to organizers, uh, and then I was getting in touch to them uh, to make it, to see if they would like me to arbiting in their tournaments or not. But then, uh, when you are quite famous, then you receive invitations from organizers. So currently, I don't write to organizers, but mostly organizers write to me. Uh, so this is uh, exactly depends on where you are standing and the, this is a journey for being arbiter at some point you need to get as much as experience as possible but then later you can select which tournaments to arbitrate okay very interesting can i ask you what your what is your most crazy story you have from arbitering a tournament was there ever something that that was really bizarre or like out of the ordinary uh, I think yes. Uh, maybe this uh, recent World Rapid and Blitz in Poland was quite bizarre because we had some players who tested positive for COVID. So at some point we had to stop the tournament, uh, stop the round uh, to make sure that all players are being uh, tested to make sure that the uh, uh, environment is safe for everybody and then you know when you stop uh, around everybody comes and asks what is happening then medias come and ask and then you cannot sometimes uh, uh, quote because you have to wait to get information from other people organizers and people in charge especially in feeder events this is uh, it has its own procedures so I think the situation was quite difficult it was not about technical matters but this is something that uh, uh, was important for safety of all players so we delayed the round for several hours to make sure that uh, the players are playing there are not uh, COVID positive and that is nothing any arbiter course can ever prepare you for. That is just something you have to decide on the spot that's in none of the books. So I can imagine it's quite a difficult decision to take. Exactly. But part of arbiting is, you know, the ability to manage things as well. So this is very important to be able to act uh, fast and proper decisions. Yeah. Another thing that I feel put like a, a complete new and unknown dimension onto arbitering is when actually corona hit and then so many of the tournaments moved online um because before most most tournaments were in person how how did you feel about that um, process and do you actually enjoy the arbitering online as well or is that something where you say this is not for you yeah, when these things happened, things started to go online and we had different chess platforms. Uh, we were not familiar with the online orbiting at the same time, but we had to experience it and learn it. And then the way that you work in each platform is different from the other one because, you know, the structure of platforms are different from each other. Eventually, we managed to find Zoom and then uh, use it in uh, chess tournaments and of course there are some other uh, video communication systems as well but Zoom is quite comfortable for chess tournaments. Uh, I can say that I really enjoyed it because I think this is the power of chess that you can use this game uh, over the board and online at the same time and uh, uh, I think it kind of uh, uh, make me made me busy during all the time of pandemic, so I was always working in tournaments, and still now that we passed those process of COVID, still we have this uh, we have our online tournaments. I was recently orbiting uh, Fisher Random Chess, uh, which was online, and I really quite enjoyed it. I guess it gives it uh, similarly than for playing. It's just a different atmosphere, shorter time control. So um, I assume as an arbiter, it's like similar that it's just like completely different skills. Though I have to say, I, I imagine it's quite tiring as an arbiter to stay focused all the time on these online tournaments. Uh, I don't think it's this tiring <laughs> because it depends. If you love your job, you are enjoying every second of it. Um, and 
there are loads of things to do. You are always supervising players, for example, you are supervising their eye contact, uh, how they the, the eyes are moving around. This is something that you have to concentrate on it. And then you have to uh, check, for example, their uh, desktops, they are sharing their desktops, their computers, the screen with you. And so you have to go through them to make sure that they don't have any applications open. And because you are working all the time, there is no time to think about other things, you know. And I don't find it uh, boring at all. Okay. Well, not boring, but I thought it would be tiring because I always feel super exhausted after like two hours in front of my screen. But it seems like you're just energetic enough to make it work. Um yeah, I'm also interested because we talk about like online chess and over the board chess. What is your personal opinion about cheating online and should it kind of have consequences on over the board games or are these for you two separate things? I think this is a difficult question to answer. Maybe uh, there are more qualified people in Fair Play Commission to answer it. But I I believe that it shouldn't be the same. Uh, I don't think if we should uh, consider people um, who are flagged in online events for over the board events at, as well, because uh, the question is that what if we make the mistake? What if, because some uh, platforms disqualify players, but then they cannot say legally that uh this player was cheating they say that uh, uh, it was uh, not following the terms and conditions of website because they see the patterns they see that the uh, statistical analysis doesn't work uh, properly for this player i mean doesn't match for, uh, properly with the level of uh, games and ratings but then uh, they cannot say for sure for 100% that this player was cheating online uh, that's why I think uh, even if one person we are making mistake, we cannot uh, extend it to over the board games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a it's a common opinion, even though I guess it's hotly debated in the chess world. Have you ever, during your time as an arbiter, whether online or over the board, have you ever experienced any cheating cases? Yes, I have experienced, uh, unfortunately, many cheating cases. We had to disqualify many players in different tournaments. But maybe it's because I also worked in many, many online tournaments since the start of the pandemic. Uh, so in national events, in Olympi online Olympiads, in different tournaments, we had the uh, experience of players who were not uh, following the a fair play procedure and this happens both in adult tournaments and in youth tournaments yes but uh, from my experience it was more common in youth tournaments unfortunately hmm. yeah i think that's one of the one of the difficult decisions to take about these cheating things is especially online i i also experienced this when we organized um tournaments in in Germany, during the time that we experienced cheating, even in very unimportant tournaments where there is no prize money and nothing, but you know, in the end, there is still kids and teenagers. So it's it's difficult to find the the right way to, in a way, punish them, but most of all, make it educational so that these things don't happen again. Yes, I think it's very important that we educate our young generation about. Uh... The, uh, about this uh, fair play and about the consequences of cheating and uh, to encourage them to play fairly uh, because uh, I think that also some part of it can be sometimes because of the parents uh, to put loads of pressure on their children uh, to win their games and then those kids don't want to uh, disappoint their parents so there are many uh, let's say underlying reasons behind of these things mm. and what role in these hopefully prevention of cheating so we stop it before it happens what what are the ways forward in your opinion should this be something that that's like the arbiter's role to educate or is this something the coaches should do or the national federations or is it a combined effort I think it should be a combined effort. I also see that uh, some platform, uh, one of the platforms was 
asking uh, people before the game to acknowledge that they are playing fairly. That was something nice because before each round, you had to confirm that uh, you are not cheating. Uh, this was something nice and also I think this is the role of just coaches to teach to kids that how important uh, the nature of chess and enjoying chess is and this is the first thing um, it's not just about winning or losing it's about uh, benefiting from different aspects of chess yeah and I guess in an ideal world then um Chess also is there, right, to, to teach sportsmanship and to teach, like, like any sport, like this fair behavior towards each other and make people learn to win and to lose, even though it's not easy to lose. <laughs> exactly. And I think that this is not just responsibility of one organization. I think this is the responsibility of uh, national federations, coaches, clubs, parents, and uh, FIDE at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I share that opinion, I have to say. Uh, another question uh, I have that, that I'm interested in is if you catch people cheating or you take them out of tournaments, have you ever had any negative reaction towards you? Or is that something as an arbiter you sometimes experience if people are unhappy with your decision? Or do people generally accept um, the arbiter's decision? I personally never experienced the uh, negative behaviors towards me, but I had people who uh, initially uh, didn't admit that they were cheating. So I had to speak to them to mention the reasons that I think they were cheating. And uh, sometimes it's uh, about, you know, uh, kids and then you get the parents involved and eventually They learned that this was a mistake and they tried to change their behavior. But uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a good way, especially for kids to get the parents involved. And as I said, make a, give them another chance, but also make it an educational learning and make sure that it shouldn't happen again. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Out of curiosity, have you ever experienced any cheating in over the board tournaments? Um, no, I haven't ever experienced any cheating in over the board tournament. I have found a cell phone in a toilet. I have uh, cases, uh, yeah, even in Olympiad, we found someone carrying cell phone with him during the games. But I didn't consider those uh, situations as a cheating. For example, uh, the case that we found a phone in a toilet, it was in Thailand chess tournament. And... Uh, Uh, the player uh, at the middle of the game realized that he has a phone and he forgot to give it to the arbiters before the round. And he thought that if I give it to arbiters now, I'm going to be forfeited. So he just wanted to get rid of his phone and he tried to hide it in a uh, toilet. So when we found it, we tried to uh, talk to the player and do some investigations and we saw that there wasn't any game from that round on the phone or there wasn't any specific uh, chess application that could be used for cheating. So your recommendation would also be in a, in a tournament if there is an honest mistake and you realize, okay, my, my phone is still in my bag and I thought it isn't. That's like a good point to go to the arbiters and be like, listen, this was a mistake and uh, there will be a solution probably. I think sometimes our rules needs to be modified uh, because there are some rules that are too strict. Uh, but I also understand the other parts uh, why it's too strict. But in some areas, uh, arbiters should have more uh, freedom to decide in such cases. Right now, uh, the rule says that if uh, it's found that the player is carrying a phone during the game, it has to be... Mm, forfeited but uh, you know there are some cases even grandmasters forget to give their phone to the uh, arbiters and then after five moves they come and say this is my phone I think it's, it's actually one of the interesting parts right about the the rules that you always think the rules are so clear and they're written there but in the end it's like a lot of 
still a lot of interpretation and and how to deal with the roles in certain situations. Yes, I think a lot of chess should be improved and can be improved a lot. Uh, Right now, there it's kind of you know controversial and. Uh, there are many suggestions that uh, can improve the laws and regulations better. Hmm. One question, uh, I guess, that always comes to my mind about arbiters is if you have, for example, a big tournament with kids, you know, that happens quite often. So I'm, I'm not an arbiter. I know nothing about arbitering, but when I still taught kids and then there's always this moment when one person said that the opponent touched the piece and the opponent says, no, I didn't. And I guess in kids tournaments, there's always, you know, so many boards that there's not like in a world championship, one arbiter in in one board. So how how would you handle a situation like that? I normally try to listen to both sides. I ask one player and then I ask the other player. And then when I see that the story doesn't match, I ask them to show me exactly uh, how they did it. And then that's most of the time it helps me to find out what was the reality. Because when they exactly repeat that uh, action again, uh, then I can see what was happening. Uh, but yeah, there are some cases that you cannot uh, figure out as well. But I think in most cases you can. And what do you do in cases where you can't figure it out? At the end, the decision has to be made, right? Um, yeah, I think uh, we need to make the most possible fair decision. I mean, if you are accusing someone to uh, for a, a touch move and then there is no evidence of that, without mm. evidence and uh, not admitting, then we cannot accept that. Mm. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, maybe following up a little bit on on you as a, on your on your personal uh, life a little bit because I saw uh, you also studied at university and that you actually published several scientific articles and I was wondering uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about what you studied and, and the work you did there as well? Yes, I was. Uh, I have a master degree in natural resources engineering, and uh, this is uh, an area that. At the time that I was studying, I really enjoyed it. So I started to work in uh, work as a researcher as well. So I was a member of Young Researchers Club, uh, which is a quite a high prestige club in Iran, because you have to be top score to be able to be a member there. Uh, so then as a member of that club, I tried to do some uh, scientific work. Uh, so I published some articles in ISI journals, and uh, then I applied to actually to study in Germany, and I got admission from a university. But at the same time, I was offered to work in uh, gen- to work in the federation and to be general secretary of Iranian Chess Federation. So I had to choose between uh, continuing there or to be. Uh, general secretary of the federation, I decided to continue with chess. And it was quite tempting at the time because I was the first female uh, general secretary in all sports. So that's how uh, I didn't continue that area more. Uh, But yeah, it's always uh, something that possible to go back there again. Yeah, see, I'm a bit biased because I'm German and I'm like a scientist, so I was quite curious. But um, I have to say, I also read actually about this this role you took as a general secretary of the Iranian Chess Federation. And I thought it was so impressive that not just within chess, but within any sport, you were the first woman to have this role. And yeah, what what did you do in this position exactly? And how did you manage to have this massive achievement of being appointed in this Uh, I think basically when you love the things that you are doing you do your best and I was always doing my best as an arbiter I I was trying to learn every new things and uh, I I was always studying and uh, I was writing articles in Iranian um, websites I translated rules and regulations and then at the time uh, in whole country, there was only one person who could run uh, live boards, electronic live, live boards. So then I started to 
practice everything myself and learn how to uh, work with the digital live words. And when I learned that, that provided me lots of opportunities because I was getting invitation to every tournament in the country uh, when they wanted to have these live games, right? Uh, so uh, then it made me quite famous in chess. <laughs> and because I, my English was good in comparison with other Iranians, also it provided me more opportunities. And I think these were the reasons. So I was basically player, organizer, running digital boards with a good English. So that was it. Just an all-around talent, nothing else to add. No, very impressive. It's, I, I mean, I don't even know what to say. You know, most people like try to excel in one thing and then there's just you doing well in, in all aspects. <laughs> so yeah, pretty cool. Okay. Um, I think we're nearly at the end of our podcast. Um, some more questions um, about women's chess in, in general. So the podcast is part of the FIDE Year of Women in Chess, which is slowly going to an end. But um, I just wanted your input on what other events, ideas you see that FIDE could do to support women in chess more, whether it's players, arbiters, coaches. I think what FIDE needs to do is uh, to have long-term plans uh, as well as short-term plans for supporting uh, uh, women's chess. Uh, it shouldn't be just advertising for one year uh, to make it the year of women in chess, although it's important to have it. But uh, we can ask ourselves what long term plans we did for female arbiters, uh, what benefits we had from, let's say, uh, Olympiads, what did we do there for ladies? Uh, because that was a big tournament that we had chess players from around the world. What was the, the difference of this Olympiad with previous one? How we made more uh, active female players? Uh, did we increase the number of arbiters or coaches or players? Uh, these things should be, uh, you know, planned in advance and then uh, publicized and uh, all uh, it's a big work, you know. All the uh, federations, all the continental federations, and FIDE needs to work together to make it possible. And uh, I think uh, still we are living in a male-dominated uh, sport. Uh, they are not easy for female to continue. We can attract some uh, female arbiters, for example, by participating in a free seminar. But then there's no follow-up for that. What are we going to do them after that? Most of the people who participate in these courses, then they get disappeared. Uh, that's why I think that we need to record the numbers. We need to have a follow-up plans and um, you know, constant encouragement for females to participate in tournaments and to act in different aspects of chess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some good ideas there. One, one very final question to end on, um, on a bit more personal note, I, what are your wishes for yourself for the next few months or years? So where do you see yourself? And maybe also what are your wishes for Iran and the women there at the moment? Uh, right now, I, I have all my concentration on Iran, to be fair, because the situation in Iran is in a way that I can't stop thinking about it, I can't really do more concentration on my uh, personal plans because everything is uh, kind of uh, in close tie with the situation of the country. It's not easy to see how many uh, people from your country are being harassed. Uh, you see that uh, people are being killed every day. You see that they their access to internet massively restricted. And then uh, people think that uh, the regime is not representing people. So uh, these are my main focuses. I want to be voice of Iranian people right now. Okay, thank you so much Shari, for being our guest today and for sharing your personal story. 
which is absolutely fascinating. And to see you excel so much, as I said, as a player, as an arbiter, and also as an ambassador for women's rights. So yeah, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much.